This is Mind for Survival with your host, Brian Duff. Hey everybody, here we are with Jeremy Lesniak. Jeremy, go ahead and get, let everybody know who you are, what you're about, and all that good stuff. Yeah, so uh, everything I do or most of the things that I do that are at least relevant to our conversation today are in the world of martial arts. I've been training since I was four, which uh, is is 40 years now, which is kind of insane. And I've had the good fortune to train with some absolutely amazing people in, in, in the world of karate and taekwondo and kickboxing. And, you know, I'm not big on on touting my my rank and stuff, but let's just say I, I've earned some higher ranks and in some various things. I've had some competitive success over the years. And uh, 12 years ago, I started a company called Whistlekick that is hell-bent on getting everyone in the world to do some martial arts, even for a little while, because I think it makes people better. It brings out the best in us. And as part of that brand, we have a podcast, Martial Arts Radio. We put out books. We host events. We've got, uh, we've got plenty of online sites. We do a ton of different things. And I just, I, I just love talking about martial arts as it fits into everybody's lives and including the preparedness side, because that's also something that I'm a little bit more quiet about, but something that's pretty important to me. Sure. Well, I think, um, on your podcast, we talked about it quickly before the show. Mm. You just don't have a podcast. It's the number one martial arts podcast, right? <laughs> it is. And it is. you have, you just, you just recorded your 900th episode. 900. Yeah, we did some something cool for nine hundred. We try to do something big for the hundred hundred level episodes. That that's that's awesome, dude. I mean, that's a that's thank a you. feat. That's a that's an accomplishment, dude. That's a yeah, lot of we're, dedication and a lot of thank work. you. Yeah, and you know, for for a long time, it was just me, and we've started adding other people to it. You know, shout out to Andrew who does a lot of work on the show, and we've had some incredible sponsors and. Uh, it's just, I mean, you, you know, you, you know, podcasting often is, is very, there are moments where it feels unrewarding, right. That you're putting all this time in and, and I, I, I try not to look at the numbers, right. Cause it doesn't matter what the numbers are. You always right. want them to be, to be bigger, but what we what, what makes an impact for me is I'll take, take a notice of the connections that our show makes, mm -hmm. you know, for example, uh, a friend that I met because of the show just taught a seminar at another friend's school that I met because of the show and they would not have met had it not been for the work that we do. Yeah. And I look at that and I'm like, that's, that's what it's about. It's not, it's not the numbers. It's, it's the, it, it's the intangible, like, I yeah. guess that's tangible, but like when you're going through it, you don't see that, you know, I think no. it's, I went back, I, there's a event back in North Carolina called prepper camp. I went to that and mm -hmm. I, I've always kind of resisted setting up a booth and, you know, I sell a little bit of swag, a little bit of t-shirt here kind of stuff, yeah. but I just do it because it throws the brand up and then people see that and they come by and say hi. And like, I had people at the booth just, you know, BSing all weekend long. Yeah. And it was like, that's what makes it worth it. it it's the, totally. it's the people who once in a while you get those emails about the show that like, mm -hmm. oh, hey man, I, I really resonated with this or that. To me, that's the you know, the the payoff that makes all the hours of doing this. I, I talked about on one of my recent shows um, cause I do these, you know, as videos as well as the audio mm -hmm. podcasts and I clip them up and stuff. And so, you know, one episode with all the, you know, guest outreach at the, the initial part and the follow up and everything, and I could have an episode take, you know, I'm sure you, you run into it too. It could take me 20 hours to get one episode yeah. done. So that makes it worth it. It does. It, it, it really does. And, you know, there's a reason most podcasts don't make it to 10 episodes. It's because people start and they think, all right, I'm going to get a friend or two together. We're going to shoot the breeze on a subject and we're going to put it out there and everybody's going to watch or listen and <laughs> sponsors are going to come rolling in and they don't realize how much work goes into this. We just got our first sponsor in our ninth year. Wow. Yeah. It took a long time to make that happen because we're not just going to put on, you know, Casper mattresses or, or yeah. other, you know, kind of generic sponsors. Yeah. I've always kind of resisted that. I've had people reach out and stuff like that. And it's not that maybe they have good brands, but I, at some point I will, but it, it's going to have to have a really good feel to the sponsor because I feel yeah. it like takes away from the show. I don't, you know, I don't know if that's what you. Yeah. To. Oh, totally. It's got, it's got to fit. Right. I mean, one of the things, you know, when, when I was talking with the team about, you know, what sort of podcasts, like 
I want to go on. Obviously, martial arts podcasts, and I've, I've been on a lot of them. Mm-hmm. But we were talking about, and I don't know how, if you, how you feel about the word. It's a very polarizing word, the prepper word, right? Yeah, I don't know if sure. you consider yourself a prepper. Some folks oh, in yeah. the preparedness space get, get a little wrapped around the axle, bent out of shape about that word. But we're talking about prepper podcasts. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm down to go on. And one of the things that that our communities kind of have together is that it's a really passionate, really trust driven community. Yeah. The moment you break trust with your audience, they're done. They're gone. They're not going to listen to anything you have to say. And so yeah. to bring on a sponsor that just, you know, what's the classic one in the podcast world, right? Like sign up for Audible. Right. 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 Everybody wants an Audible account. It's had an Audible account. You know, I, I don't. We don't need to put that on the show. We want to. You know, I'm. We want to bring stuff that our audience is like. Yeah. Oh, you 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 have a relationship with this brand. Okay. My trust with you. Now I'm going to give them some of that trust. And well, I'm, I'm sure when the time's right, you'll do the same thing. And that's the other side with with doing um, setting up those relationships with brands. Right. Like you're putting your yeah. name on that. Exactly. Your brand on it. And if if the if their brand. If you're just chasing the dollars, man, that, I don't know. I, I think that's kind of, I don't know if it's selling out. People got to do what they got to do, but it, it's, it, it doesn't feel like it aligns with like the value. You know, if it doesn't feel like it aligns yeah. with the values of your brand, then that just kind of killed. I think it's terrible. I, I call that short-term money. Short-term right. money burns out, right? But if you want to b- build medium to long-term money, it takes a long time to, uh, to get that flywheel going if you want the Jim Collins metaphor. <laughs> and once you get it rolling it becomes very hard to stop. And that's where we're at. You know, we, we've, we've built an amazing community of people who will show up and, and buy and, and review and trust. And it's yeah. taken, you know, 20 times 900 plus all the other things. So, so you've been in a martial arts since you were four, you said 40 years. Yeah. So obviously yeah. after 40 years, like you said, you have some belts. Um, How'd you get started into the the martial arts podcast? Was it just one of those things like I, I got some information I want to put out, or sort of? So, if if I ever if I ever write an autobiography, it's going to be titled "I'll Do It Myself." And I I got sick of the the quality of protective equipment in the martial arts space. That the quality was actually going down over time. And I said, "Is somebody making better stuff?" In short version, no. So designed the products, found the factory, got that stuff in, and then realized, oh, just having a better mousetrap doesn't mean people are going to buy it. And so started kind of pulling some things together. And a friend of mine was going to host the podcast because I I was going to focus on other things. And then damn it, Glenn just went and had a heart attack and nearly died. And uh, he moved down to Tennessee and I'm up here in Vermont and, you know, shout out to Glenn and went, well, it's still a great idea. I guess I'll do it myself. And I had no idea what I was doing. If anybody goes back and they check out the first few episodes of the podcast, it's it's bad, especially compared to the the newer stuff. It's not very good. But you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. So well, it's I a just, learning process, right? Yeah. Like anything, right? Like <laughs> I refer to it as the martial arts mindset, right? We show up, we just try to get 1% better every time we train and do our thing and Eventually, if you don't quit, you look up one day and go, "Wow, I'm actually okay at this." Yeah, yeah. That that that. I look back at some of my old episodes, you know, my early episodes. Like, Oof, those were rough. But like you said, you have to start somewhere with everything. You know, it's like everybody, you have everything. to be bad at things before you become good at them. Yeah. That, have you heard uh, the stages of learning where it goes from? Um, unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to yeah. conscious uh, competence to unconscious competence. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I like to use the metaphor of walking when I'm teaching martial arts, especially if I'm teaching seminars, you know, because not only does it follow that arc, but we have a much healthier attitude towards walking because it tends to be something babies do. We never yell at a baby for being terrible at walking when they start, right? The baby's falling over and they're stumbling around. But unfortunately, as adults, we become very judgmental of ourselves mm-hmm. and of others. And and their initial output of a new skill. And I don't think that's productive. Yeah. What got you into martial arts originally? 
I mean, at four, I was, was four. It like their parents yeah. were like, it, hey, why don't you start this? Yeah. Or? We were at the beach and my mother met the instructor and, and apparent from what I've been told, the conversation went, would you take someone as young as four? And she said, I don't see why not. And uh, from what I'm told, <laughs> after me, they didn't take anybody under six. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was troublesome. Uh, but I was there day one when they opened that school, and I'm the only one that's still training. Wow. That, that's yeah. something. It's, it's changed my life. It's been, it was such a wonderful, we can almost call it an accident that it happened. Yeah. And I'm so thankful. But please, ah, the, uni the universe speaks the way the universe speaks, right? It, it points you in the right direction. And yeah, you know, you can resist it. I, I find sometimes that like, if I resist it, it just, it keeps nudging you until it just feel. eventually it's like, oh, this is the way I have to go. And then that's what works out. Right, right. So you mentioned earlier, like, uh, that you're, you know, you're about the prepper term. I think, I think people kind of like you mentioned something a minute ago where, you know, people judge themselves. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's, you have to be okay with what you're doing, right? Like I tell people I'm a prepper, like I'm, I'm all into this stuff, right? I, I enjoy it. It's, it's fun. I enjoy You know, it's like the martial arts community. In a lot of ways you, you have a lot of really good people that are involved in it that are passionate about the stuff. So I really enjoy it from that aspect. And I think, um, worrying about what other people view you as and, and worrying about the name just it doesn't do you any good you know you got to try to get past that because i think t especially today i mean i have friends that they they don't you know they're not going to go to prepper aa basically go to 12 step program for preppers and admit they have a problem but when you talk to them they're they're all into they're all into preparedness they just don't want they just don't say that i'm a prepper but like right Dude, you got a generator. Have their paychecks, ammo. Yeah, you got you got a generator. You got a pile of ammo. You got a pile of you know long term storage food. You have all this stuff. That's that's yeah. kind of it. For sure. What what yeah, so what 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 are your thoughts on the whole preparedness thing, man? What do you? I think everyone should be prepared. Right. And and I don't just mean in the way that in in the preparedness community. People often think of it, you know, in preparedness, we're, we're, we're talking about basic needs and everything. But I think one of the places that we've gone wrong, you know, in my perspective as a, an American living in the Northeast my entire life, when I was growing up, people took care of themselves. You know, I grew up in rural Maine and everyone had a garden and everyone had a firearm, whether or not they hunted and people would fix some of their own stuff. And if you had a problem with somebody else, you found a productive way to handle it. You didn't outsource all of your food, all of your safety, all of your responsibility to other, um, other entities. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, when I, when I look at preparedness, to me, it's the extreme belief that maybe we should be a little more self-sufficient, not just in food and safety, but in attitude. You know, one of the things I've, I've said time and again, and people, a lot of people, I doubt your audience, but a lot of people get real bent out of shape when I say this. Nobody's going to care about you more than you. Nobody's going to care about your money more than you. Your financial advisor does not care about your retirement more than you do. Your doctor does not care about your health more than you do. If you care up here, they'll care here. If you care down here, they're going to be underneath that. Yeah. And so when you when you start to recognize that, that you know, I, I'm a I'm a, a independent, thoughtful human being that has some say over my life and my lifestyle, I think the path forward inevitably becomes preparedness whether you call it that or not right when do you think where you know you said people used to be self-reliant and described your time in maine where do you think that fell off when do you know, you know what are your thoughts like what caused it what what's making people tick on that I, well it certainly was gradual but i think it became i, I think it's the transition from 
things being expensive to things being cheap. When you have enough, I mean, the only resource we can't get back is time, right? So right. if I can go to the store and reliably buy all the food that I want, I don't have to put the time into a garden. Maybe I want to put the time into a garden. If I can confidently, it's a whole other conversation we'll probably get into, call mm -hmm. law enforcement because there's a, a something threatening my physical safety, I don't have to spend the time knowing how to use a firearm, being aware, maybe setting up cameras, martial arts, et cetera. We outsourced all that stuff. And like a lot of things that we do, the pendulum swings and it swings to extremes and we're out towards the extreme right now. We want everybody else to take care of us and it doesn't take very long watching, I guarantee you, any of you, if you spend 60 seconds on social media, scroll through any platform of your choice, you will find somebody complaining about somebody else not taking care of them. And I think that's the root of just about every problem we have today. Yeah, the I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of problems with per, personal responsibility, accepting that, hey, you know what? There, there's times everybody needs help, right? But like... Mm -hmm. You need to you need to to nut up, I guess, and and start sorting stuff out. You had a really good quote, dude, and I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. Is Violence you said the is. the only resource we can't get back is time. Yeah, that's huge. And and it's so true, right? And one of the and and I wish I was better at this. I'm I'm not <laughs> good at this. Full disclosure, but I try to spend my time in ways that when I'm old and I'm on my deathbed and I think back over my life and I say, you know, am I happy with how I handled that situation? That I will be. You know, do I get this project over the goal line to to meet what somebody else wanted? by working till 10 or 11 o'clock tonight? Or do I shoot them a message and say, you know what, some other stuff came up. I'm not gonna be able to get this to you tomorrow so I can go spend some time with a friend or go to the gym or go for a walk. You know, what does old Jeremy want to look back on? And it becomes pretty obvious when you do that. Yeah, it's interesting too, as you get older, right? How those priorities change where it's like, it becomes more less about the chase and, you know, and looking at the next thing and, more about, oh, you know, we need to enjoy this stuff while we're here. Right. Yeah. So in what ways has your, you know, your martial arts journey? I mean, you had a lifetime of this, you know, it's you yeah. know, most people start when they're in their <laughs> teens and, you know, stuff like that. You, it's been your life. Um, yeah. How has that made you, you know, more prepared and minded? Has that had any impact on you? Or? Yes. And I did not realize that it did until I got older and and started finding myself drifting into preparedness spaces. And also, you know, as an adult, uh, becoming a homeowner, th things that seem trivial. And then you have conversations with other, pe other people who do not have the same mindset. For example, um, I bought my house and I just started planting things. I started planting nut trees and berry bushes and putting in gardens and doing all of these things that to me were just cool. I've got the space. I can do this now. And I talked to other people and they're like, oh, but you know, it's going to take forever to, the, you know, those trees aren't going to produce for three, five years. So right. right? why would I not do that? Or making sure that at any given time, I've got enough food that I can just you know, if there's a bad storm and, you know, lasts a couple days, maybe I don't want to go to the grocery store. Maybe I'm head down at a project. I can eat for a few days at minimum. You know, I, I forget what the statistics are, but the majority of people in the U.S. don't have 72 hours of food. I think it is. It's something you, ridiculous. No, like you're 100% right. Yeah, it's a huge percent. And that percent blows my mind, right? I probably have 72 hours of food in the car. <laughs> right so what, was yeah. it some was it something that um was it just the mindset that you drifted into or was there ever anything that like prompted that you know like an event or anything that just it or no. just how you've always been wired it's just how i've been. always been you know yeah. i i got on the i got it on one side 
you know, through martial arts. And I got it on the other side as um, a very, you know, I, I grew up with my mother and, and she was, you know, we didn't have a lot. And when you don't have a lot, you have to be conservative with things. You have to make things last. And a lot of those skills and attitudes actually, you know, whether you call them preparedness or they at the very least lend themselves to being prepared through life. You know, we weren't buying, you know, if we had $50 to go to the grocery store, it wasn't two days of food. It was how many days of food can this be? Yeah. You know, it was, it was eating rice and pasta and admittedly, you know, had different perspectives on on uh, the value of those foods back then. But uh, when I went to college, here's a fun story. When I went to college, there, there, I remember this very clearly. Some of the foods that I grew up eating, I didn't realize were uncommon. You know, one of my favorite meals growing up was egg noodles, you know, like the pasta, yeah. but it's really with cottage cheese. I didn't know other people didn't eat that. I've bumped into like two other people who've eaten that. And as I went through college, I realized my mother hid the fact that we didn't have. So yeah, it just, it kind of all coalesced as I, as I graduated college and went off on my own and, you know, living on my own. And I started teaching martial arts right out of college and I wasn't like everybody else. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your mom did a great job on. She did. You know, not if things were tight, not you didn't realize that they were tight. And that yeah. I think that's a pretty phenomenal thing. Yeah, I, there are things I can look back on and see, oh, OK, you know, now that I'm an adult and I can look back and go, OK, this is what she was doing to hide it. And I can see it now. But, you know, as a little kid, I didn't I didn't know. I knew we didn't have as much as other people, but I never would have called us poor. And I still wouldn't today. But. I think other people might have. Well, it sounds like she was give, make, letting you doing things so that way you felt like you were just a normal other kid, right? Yeah. Which is. I was always safe. Yeah. I was always safe. And I think that's, that's key. You know, it's, it's being safe is the most, uh, the strongest driver to our existence. You know, people will do crazy things to feel safe in the absence of safety. I think that's, and I, I had this conversation yesterday with uh, with a friend. I think that's part of what has our world so, I don't know what, how to describe it right now. So, you know, not, I don't even want to go down the violent road. So just this upheaval that's going on, the, um, the you know, up is down, down is up kind of thing yeah. right now. And I think there's a lot of, the corporate media and other people are just mm -hmm. really keeping pe people in a fear state, have yeah. fear going through their mind. It's a crisis every day or every couple of days. There's a major right. crisis that reinforces this fear drive that keeps people in this on some, at least some low level, a sympathetic nervous system response yep. that is kind of over overwhelming them, you know? And, Absolutely. And, if you look at, human evolution, if you look at the way we respond to information, mm -hmm. I, I I might be pulling this number out of thin air, so forgive me if, if I'm wrong, but this number is in my brain that our receptiveness to negative, scary, fear-based information is some has something like a 7x impact over positive good. Because if we, if we go back, however far back you want to go, we go back to tribal times. Yep. So and so having a birthday or whatever, that wasn't a threat to my survival. But there being a lion on the horizon, that I need to dial in on, right? Because that might end my existence. So we yeah. became hardwired towards that scary information. And that hasn't, excuse me, that hasn't gone away. And yeah. media is taking advantage of that. Yeah. Well, it's part of the marketing thing, right? It's exactly, you know, yeah. I'm sure you've done marketing with your business. You know, there's, mm -hmm certain ways I mean, you can go about reaching people and talking about your lion and birthday example, you know, it's your rational brain, your prefrontal cortex would think about the birthday and maybe some good feelings in there, but the lion comes up and it goes straight to your amygdala, right? It goes straight down to the base of your, your instinctual brain that it doesn't want you to think it wants you to react and to take over. And I think that's what's happening with so many people. 
that they're being given they're being driven by this this fear-based thing that we have going on in society and then at the same time the people who are driving the fear are also going hey here's the solution do what i say follow what i do right. and so they want that quick fix cuz fear doesn't feel good so let me do something that's going to fix my fear and the next mm -hmm. thing you know they feel better cuz they think they're getting a result that's lowering their buy my fear. book buy my course buy my 5 years of food storage whatever it is mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that we have not grown as fast as we could have is i refuse to do that mm -hmm. i will not f hijack people's fear response to sell them a thing. I will not tell them that all they have to do to feel better is watch our show, buy this thing, sign up for this course. You know, we put out great stuff. Sure. That, yeah, it does offset some of the tribulations of life. And we'll call attention to that, but I'm 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 not gonna go quite that far. It just it, to me, it's not an in integrity. No, that's your values, right? That's your core yeah. values. And I think that's one of the things I try to get people, especially today where um, everything's so kind of crazy and chaotic with a lot of this stuff. I'm like, you have to know your core values, right? That you, and you know, I, I, I actually say mine out most days, character, love, hope, and independence, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I'm going down a road where I feel off about something, I'll stop at times and go, wait, am I trying to force something that's not in alignment with what I, you know, what I feel, what I believe. And then you know, sometimes you catch yourself, but yeah, I think that's a, a huge problem that, that people are, are getting baited into stuff to, to pay money, open up their wallet, give up their resource. They can't give back time for something that someone says it's going to make you feel better when really the way you feel better is by doing the work. And, and I think looking inward and working on that, that way. Spoken like a martial artist. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so kind of talking about that, do you have it? And it's, and I talk about like, I, I usually open up the shows to talk about like, Hey, what, what's your views on preparedness and you know, what, what's your big bugaboo or what, what's the thing that concerns you most? Cause everybody that listens to us has a thing. They're all, yeah. I've surveyed the audience and everybody's worried about something. Right. And it's been interesting. Um, the last survey I did a couple months back, I think the last before that had been a couple of years that I had since I'd surveyed the audience and, and surveyed followers before that it was people were worried about like oh the super volcano this asteroid that kind of stuff and now that's all shifted like natural disasters are really low people are worried about you know politics are worried about all this stuff do you have anything that you kind of go huh, I should keep an eye on that See, one of the challenges as a martial artist is you, we are conditioned to be as observant as possible. Right. Right. So I'm paying attention to all that stuff. Okay. But I'm not prepared equally for all of it. Sure. Right. Now, here I am. I'm in Vermont. If the, if the Yellowstone volcano goes off, probably not a big deal out here. You know, we're, we're kind of on the edge. Um if an asteroid hits, right, that's luck of the draw. Yeah. But when we start talking about things like political unrest, I live in the woods. That's by design. When we talk about things like uh, maybe an EMP, mm -hmm. you know, um, I have made sure that I have options available to me for my continued survival that are not behind l electronic locks, right? Like right. as much as I'm a tech guy, I'm actually, I, I had an IT company for a long time oh, nice. and I love technology. You know, I used to have a saying at that company, paper doesn't break. You know, I do like my analog options as well. That's so, nice. you know, it's, um, and I, I don't know if you know, Jack Spierko, the survival podcast, yeah. Jack's a great yeah. guy. I've been on, been on that show a couple of times and, and he put it out really cleanly. The likelihood of the disaster is inversely proportional to how many people it affects. Yeah, that so makes sense. He gives the example, you lose your job. That affects you. Pretty high likelihood compared to an EMP or a super volcano. Right. Right. And you, you, can, you can chart it out from there. So I am most prepared for the things that are most likely to happen. I'm self-employed. Yep. I have multiple streams of income. 
you know, these are the things that that allow me to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. um, but to to give a bit, maybe a bit of a sexier answer to the question that you pose, the thing that I am most concerned about right now is if we take a look at what has happened, not just in the United States, but in many parts of the world over the last five years, the, the rapidity with which things have changed in a way that I don't think anybody's happy about. Right. What, what, whatever you decide to, whatever you want to lay as the cause, wherever you want to put the, the responsibility, I don't think that's what's most relevant. I think what's most relevant is that we're pretty much all in agreement that what's going on sucks and it's not good and it's not getting better. That's what I'm most concerned about. You know, here, here I am in Vermont and, um, you know, I'm, I'm watching our, our, we actually, uh, per capita rank second for homelessness. Uh, really? you know, yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're screwing some stuff up in this state. I would never uh, thought that. Uh, there are there are a lot of things going on, and it's not just here; it's everywhere. There's stuff it's, going on everywhere, whether it's overdoses and the political stuff, and it all contributes. It's all different ingredients that are ending up in the same recipe, and they're all pushing it in the same direction. Yeah, and that's what I'm what I'm worried about. Yeah, I um, actually it was a podcast that I did uh, a week or two ago that dropped today um, with Doctor Nina Serfolio and. Um, she has a wild backstory. She was a, she's mm -hmm. a psych psychologist, psychoanalyst person. Um, and she was a nine, she got cancer after being a uh, re first responder to nine mm -hmm. 11. And then she went over to help out in the uh, second Chechen war and a KGB mm -hmm. agent, um, I FSB now, but, uh, you know, yeah. one of their Intel agency poisoned her with man-made anthrax. Right. And so we, we got in, we, we talked about that and she's gone down the rabbit hole. She has a book out that she talks about a lot of, you know, how to deal with violence in society and terrorism and different things like that. And, you know, she's like the amount of violence and I, I would even extend it to the upheaval we have going on or just what seems like unrest, not like you know, riots happening right now, but there's an uneasiness to society is a is an indicator of how sick or healthy a society is and you know it's like i think we have a pretty ill society right now i would agree definitely um and when it comes to martial arts man um shift the gear back into your wheelhouse sure. how can you know martial arts training benefit people in the preparedness community i mean i'm all yeah. for it it's you know i love the mindset yeah. of martial arts i love you know, it, it centers yourself, you know, when I, when I've gone and when I go do jujitsu, it's, I come home at, oh, peace nice. after, I come home at peace yeah. afterwards. I mean, I feel like I'm a pretzel, but you know, <laughs> come, come home like uh, much. Jujitsu, the art of, of folding clothes with people in them. <laughs> right. So when we think about martial arts, I think we can, we can kind of split it into two categories, right? One of them is, is. The, the soft skills, right? The discipline, self-confidence, awareness, uh, you know, just kind of grit, you know, that resiliency to, to keep going, to keep persisting when something is difficult. Uh, and then the other side are the more physical skills. And it's, you know, while I'm not going to say martial arts training is the best way to get physically fit, that that is a component, right? You got the cardio, you'll build some strength. But there's a piece, and it blows my mind when I look at the preparedness community. This, I believe, this is the biggest gap in most people's preps as they see them. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to deal with a non-lethal threat. Yeah. Firearms are amazing at doing one thing and one thing only, and that's taking a life. And I am not going to tell someone to not carry a firearm. I have one with an arm's reach right now. You probably do too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> right? Guns are great. Guns are fun. Mm -hmm. I love shooting. But what if it's someone that I don't, that does not mean me lethal harm? Right. What if it's a friend who drank too many and, and they got belligerent? What if I'm out and I... I look at somebody in their mind the wrong way. Now they're escalating. 
and the only tool I have at my disposal is a firearm. That escalates the situation even further. But because I have now a whole continuum from some joint manipulation, some jiu-jitsu grappling stuff, to some striking stuff, now I can mix that in and go anywhere from, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bump into you, all the way up to, yes, I am attempting to take your life. I can handle, hopefully, threats anywhere on that spectrum. Yeah. And if all you have is a gun, you have to escalate the situation up to the point of lethal force. Mm -hmm. And to me, being prepared is mitigating situations, not escalating them. I 100% agree with that. And I think it's something... A lot of it comes, I guess, from my time when I was doing diplomatic security overseas. And and mm -hmm. even now, I really got into use of force continuum. And it's like, I don't I don't always leave the house with a firearm. I'm getting a lot better. I carry it a lot more now with just the way things are going. But at a, you know, when I go to the gym, I, I don't like, I don't want to have to carry like a, you know, fanny pack or something around with my gun in it. Cause then, you know, if you get a good workout in your smoke, I might walk off and leave it sitting next to some bench. And then that's a whole, you know, I don't want to bother with that. Yep. So, but I always do have pepper spray on me. And if I carry, I always have pepper spray because it gives me something that's, I have distance and it gives me yep. something to end a situation, hopefully before, like you say, your only result, if you have a firearm, your only option is nothing or it's that firearm. It it drove me nuts, man. I, I worked uh, when I worked overseas, so I, I did dip my security. I worked for Blackwater for a few years, mm -hmm. um, protected Joe Biden at one point, protected a bunch of diplomats and different stuff. And oh, wow. especially early on, the the methodology was we would they would put these stickers on the back of like you know letters on the back of your car Arabic, and it would say "Stay back 100 meters, mm -hmm. or you might be shot." Right. Well, you couldn't read that at 100 meters because you're, you're putting a lot of words on the back of the car. So then obviously people get in with that. And there were times people would roll up and 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 they would blow out the engine block. And it's just not, you know, you're shooting a belt fed in somebody's engine block. So I lobbied to get us um, like paintball guns with yellow paint. Mm -hmm. You can shoot a paintball gun 50 meters or plus, right? And like, hey, put a couple of paintballs into their windshield. Yep. And it came back from State Department, from the diplomatic security side of the house, that we they didn't have a course of training for paintball guns. Therefore, we weren't allowed to use them. So the only thing you had at the time was a belt-fed 7.62 that, you know, causes problems. And it's just I, like you're breaking that use of force continue. You're taking away options. And that's such a big thing. Right. And pepper spray is a great additional tool in that. That spectrum, you called it a continuum there. Absolutely. But what, what I find interesting, and it happens with firearms, but it do, it ha seems to happen more with non-lethal tools. You know, um, you know, I, I, I carry a pocket knife. I've trained yeah. with this pocket knife. Mm -hmm. How many people carry a knife, though, and think, I can use this if there's a problem, but they've never trained with it. Right. Or they have pepper spray, and they've never trained with it. They've never used the inert stuff or right. you know maybe you've talked about this on on your show but uh heads up people if you use pepper spray in a confined space it's going to affect you too Get you you know people don't think about these things and because they don't train with this it, it leaves this gap that people wait too long as violence occurs and it continues to escalate that at the opportunity to mitigate to defuse de-escalate extract they miss that opportunity and then right. it becomes a bigger problem. And so when I teach self-defense, I'm teaching things that not only are they non-lethal, I refer to them as non-injurious. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you get under somebody's nose and you can pull up on their nose, yeah. the moment you break somebody's balance under their nose, they're not worried about anything else. But what's awesome about that is what if you get it wrong? What if the person wasn't trying to pull you into the car? Well, now you have an awkward situation to talk about. Maybe you're having a quick chat with the cops. That's a heck of a lot better than, why did you break his arm? Well, I thought he was trying to kidnap me. Right. No, I just got shoved because somebody was running down the street and pushed me. Yeah. 
No, I think that's huge. And I think it's one of the things that martial arts teaches. I, I took Thai boxing for a bunch of years mm -hmm. and went to Thailand, did all that nonsense, all that. And nice. I remember uh, early on when I first got into it, I was getting cocky. I was a little bigger uh, than most of the people, especially when you get around the ties, right? And right. Um, they are not a large. This was this was out when I was out in Los Angeles at the time, and like I said I was getting cocky, and then you get in the ring to start sparring, and the first time I got hit, it was like, oh, this is a whole different ball game here. Like that 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 adds something to it, you know, and and having that. I'm not saying everybody needs to go out and get training, but like you said, if you're going to spray pepper spray, you're you're gonna you're gonna eat some of that pepper spray. Especially, you know, you don't know which way the wind's blowing. You're going to have to do what you have to do, so you may catch a face full of it. Ranger Battalion, we um, they would take us into the gas chamber. We had a gas chamber behind Ranger Battalion, and we would go in there and they'd light off the OC tablets or whatever they were, and we did. They'd make us go go in there and do do PT in there. We'd have to go do a workout inside for like an hour inside it, and you'd be surprised after a little while. Yeah, it's a, it's an irritant, but you're like, oh, okay, I got this. Yep. It's it's like it's like any other kind of pain when you're talking about starting Muay Thai, and I'm imagining the first time you took a leg kick, <laughs> you probably weren't standing right, and and so for the audience, this is something that a, a lot of martial arts don't do in Muay Thai. It is a it's a staple, yeah. and they'll come across and they'll they'll take you'll take a kick, usually. But just above or just below the knee, yeah. and if you're not used to it, you're on one leg. Yeah, you're probably down. It yeah. hurts. And if you don't believe me, when was the last time you bumped your leg on the coffee table, and that almost brought you down? Right. right. This is a whole different ball game. Yeah, and I think that's important for people to get. You know, it's you can have the knowledge, you can have the skill, and you can have the resources and everything, but until you get out and actually really engage in that stuff to the point where it's it's physically testing you, mentally testing you. I think that's the one of the best ways to prepare for problems because you're get yes. You know, it's like problem solving under duress, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, talked about sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous right. system earlier, right? Fight or flight, rest and digest. And one of the things that we're we're just really starting to understand, and this is the core of, of what when I travel, what I'm teaching, is this idea that the moment someone goes into fight or flight, they can't receive information. Right. You become you become tunnel vision. And a lot of martial arts schools, and, and they're getting better, but a lot of martial arts schools keep people at that and, elevated state, and then they're trying to stuff information into their brain and it doesn't work. Yeah. You've got to train at a, at a chill enough place that you can understand what's happening and start to draw some some patterns and work for that. Yeah, well, I think you do that to help um, become more familiar with what it's like to operate in a sympathetic nervous system reaction yes. because uh, – the more you are, the more you are in a sympathetic nervous system reaction without working and to understand it, the less likely that your prefrontal cortex, it's designed this way. Our brain is designed this way. It's a safety mechanism. Um, you can have up to a 45% decrease in your ability of your prefrontal cortex to, to inhibit or stop that sympathetic nervous system reaction. So like you mm -hmm. said, you're not taking in information you're going on instincts and a lot, a lot of time that that's not your best friend, right? Like you may do actions. I mean, it's when I was working as a paramedic there, you know, um, a guy threw something at somebody. It was like a ball of paper. He was just screwing around with his buddy threw his, threw a, threw a ball of paper, at his buddy. And for whatever reason, it triggered this dude. And he jumped out of a, like a second story window. Mm -hmm. like to, to get away from this. Right. And so that was all sympathetic nervous system response. So yeah. in those situations, you got to be able to, to work on it. And I think martial arts probably does a great job of that getting dialing in. So you, you can pull yourself back out of that when you realize it's happening. Yeah. Like anything, you know, if you think about 
I mean, we, we can come up with plenty of examples that are non-combative. You think mm -hmm. about the first time you, you ask somebody on a date. I don't know about you. I remember that. It was it's terrifying. <laughs> I, I, I would rather go through just about anything than that experience again. But here I am, you know, I, I've, I've been around a few years. I've asked a few girls out. It's not nearly as scary as it was. And almost everything else follows that same pattern that as you repeat it in a safe way, you raise the bar for what's going to kick you into that sympathetic state. Yeah. And that is something that martial arts training does amazingly well. And it's something I work with my students on to keep them just below that level most of the time because that's where you're going to make the most rapid progress. If you want to learn firearms, you don't go out into a live firefight. You go to the range. You do some paintball rounds, right? You you get gets you approach various elements of the whole and you connect those dots in a way that give you an approximation. Because the risk of going to the full tilt scenario not really worth it. How do you teach your students that? How do you work on them with that? Lots of free form movement, sparring, done at a lower intensity. So my, my students are generally moving. We, we, we talk about uh, the speed and the strength dial. And most of our sparring is done at what I call a one out of five, which right. is what uh, the, the easiest way to think about it is, is Tai Chi. Right, the way you, most people have seen Tai Chi, like super slow. And why do we do that? Because they can see what's going on. They're they're building this huge database in their mind of when this hand moves this way, that is open. When I move my hand this way, they tend to do this. And so it builds this database because let's face it, when you turn the speed up, even to a three, you can't think fast enough. So you right. have to go on instinct. So I'm helping them build those instincts in a place that makes them, that keeps them feeling safe. And it's working amazingly well. One, once in a while, I let the reins off of them a little bit. And, you know, I'm watching people that have, ha that have a dozen classes under their belt and they're, you know, and they're, they're there. They look like yeah. they've been doing Kung Fu for 10 years. Nice. Well, you're, um, have you ever studied situational awareness months? Uh, not, I, I wouldn't say in a formal sense, Okay, you know, but I grew up a nerd. So you got to be really aware when you're the yeah. biggest nerd in school and anybody could come for you at any time. Right. It, it's so it's, I guess it, this look back here, John Boyd, he was the guy who kind of create, he created a thing called the OODA loop and it stands for observe, orient, decide, mm. and act. Yep. And so the way it happens is you have your observations, which, um, are all your senses, your subconscious, you know, that's monitoring everything that goes around you. And you bring all that information in. And then in the orient phase, you you parse it, right? You analyze it, you, you, you look at it through, and this is all unconsciously happening typically, unless you're actually thinking about something. But then you 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 it you kind of filter it with your cultural norms, your experience, and everything else to come up with. Hey, this is what's going on. And then from there you make a decision. It's a decision model. Basically you make okay. a decision on what, what course of action you should do. And then you take an action based upon that. What you're doing is you're really, you're, you're getting them more able to observe. And then you're also, you're front loading that orientation process where, Hey, I need to analyze what's going on by you moving them, moving through them slow they're locking that in. So when they see that down the road, it's like, Hey, it's, it, it's right away. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, th this is stuff that I've been working on for about five years. And like most of what I've done professionally, I'm a little bit ahead of the curve, which, yeah. uh, carries some ups and downs to it. Right. Um, but it's been fascinating to watch their development and see, you know, my, my school, I, I had a school years ago, had to shut it down. I have a school again. And, you know, the students that have been there from day one, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, we're at like nine, eight months and they're moving. They're moving two to four times better than what I would expect them to based on traditional martial arts education. And so 
I think that model works for anything, right? And it, it's it's even led to uh, sort of a, a rough back of the napkin formula. Progress requires safety. You have to feel safe. Mm-hmm. Plus discomfort. Not, I'm going to ask you to jump off this cliff, but maybe if you're if you're trying, if progress is, I'm trying to get better with heights, mm-hmm. I'm not going to start you on the cliff. I'm going to start you, you know, on a chair. Or if that's too much, I'm going to start, you, right? Whatever that line is to make you a little bit uncomfortable, but you also know you're safe. And you have to do that not once. You can't get stronger in the gym by going lifting all the weights one time. You have to do it over a period of time with some frequency. Yeah. And if you if you check those four boxes, you can progress at anything. Yeah, I agree. I think I think there's I saw something, it was some quote somewhere, but basically it's like you you had to have to truly have growth, you have to have resistance to mm-hmm. get there. It's kind of like going to the gym, right? Like you, you can you can go to the gym all you want, but if you want to, you know, get get bigger, get stronger, you have to lift the weights. You have to have resistance and and and, and, and that, that load has to progress. Right. If you want to continue to progress, your definition of what is discomfort has to continue to increase. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people now they don't want to be it's hard people will shy away from discomfort, you know, whether people it's do not want to be uncomfortable. They want we we have jumped the shark, so to speak, on <laughs> comfort versus discomfort, right? We and, and there's a counter movement to it now, right? I don't know if you see uh, people taking ice baths and saunas and uh, people running, you know, extreme marathons, you know, these hundred mile things. Uh, it, it is what I believe led to the rise of the Spartan race and, and the other obstacle course races. People realized on some primal level, I am too comfortable. I need I need to shake myself out of this constant comfort. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that's a, it's a, that's a big thing. You know, I mean, it gets down to the simple level of, you know, trying to get healthier, right. You know, like, Hey, maybe I shouldn't eat all that, drink all that soda. Maybe I shouldn't eat this garbage. Um, and I'm not saying I'm perfect with it either. I try to be, although I don't drink soda. It's, um, Cause it's the easy, the comfortable thing to do. Let me reach for this. Like, I don't want to have, you know, like my snacks now are like, dude, I, I hate what I eat. Like I love eating, give me a bag of nacho, bag of Dorito, cheese Doritos and, oh. you know, like some junk from the, the gas station. That's my, that's where I feel good. But what do I do? You know, like before we got on here, I'm like, oh, I need to eat something. So I went and cooked up some, you know, frozen cauliflower rice, like I'm go. eating this, I'm like, oh, this stuff sucks. But it's if you, I want to be healthier and I want to work on that, so it's trying to make those. You have to sacrifice, I think, uh, if you want to improve. Yeah, and I think you know a lot of people. It's it's really easy to look at anything in the world as odd or off, right? There are a lot of people who look at you know they'll take that situation that that you just explained with the food. Mm-hmm. Well. Eventually, I'm going to lose the willpower and I'm going to have the bag of nacho, uh, the bag of Doritos, which, by the way, nachos with Doritos. If you ever if you ever really want to go all in. Wait, wait, nachos, describe this to me. I'm, I'm make, like totally jonesing right now, so I might be derailing <laughs> myself this weekend. But what is this? Instead of using plain corn chips, use Doritos for your chips and your nachos. Oh. I'm sorry in advance. It's not something I do often, but it's amazing, right? But it's not something I do often. Yeah, but it's not something I do never, right. because once in a while, I'm gonna I'm gonna give in. I'm gonna indulge. I'm gonna enjoy. The way I eat at home is not the way I necessarily eat when I go out with friends. Yeah, I, I'm trying to find some balance at all of these things, but it does require some effort. There are a lot of people who, who would approach food in, in from a place of addiction. I can only eat the cauliflower rice. I can only eat the this, that, the other, the, you know, boiled chicken or whatever, that that's how they're going to do it because they, they don't feel confident or they can't in, you know, dabble on the other side. Right. You know, I don't drink a soda often, 
but they are cheap and they taste good and they feel good and they're available everywhere. And I'll do that once in a while. And I'm usually halfway done and I go, oh, I, I wish I hadn't done this. <laughs> But it gives me some balance. And and I think we can make the same case for just about everything. But it's that nuance that requires a, a lot of energy. Right. That, that dis- deliberation, do I have a small bag of chips and then go for the healthier stuff? Or do I just give in? It's easier to give in. Mm-hmm. It can also be easier to just do without entirely. But life's in the middle. It's in the gray. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things in the in the prepper space that a lot of people miss. They're so focused on their prepping that they miss that life is happening right now. That you know the they're so committed to okay, on the other side of the EMP, I will survive and yeah, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe you believe with 100% certainty it's going to happen, but what's making your life valuable until then because mm-hmm. If you're not having at least some fun in life, what's the point? Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, and I'm, my audience is probably sick of hearing about it, but I, I have a book coming out here in the next uh, oh, cool. several months. And when I was writing the book, I focused initially, I was like, ah, here's my goals of preparedness, survival and minimizing unwanted struggle. Mm-hmm. But then as I was diving into it and I'm working on the book, I'm like, it just didn't settle with me. I was like, yeah. something just, it doesn't, it's that's there, but it just seems like, yeah, it's not enough. Mm. It's, you know, but I'm like, what am I going to add to that? And then I realized it like, well, what's the point of those two? Mm. It's to live your best possible life. And I like to tell people that, you know, especially in the preparedness world. And I was there for a while, like everything was about preparedness. I'm like, but if you, you know, you can't ruin your today worrying about a tomorrow that may never happen. And you know, it, it, it's part of one of the, th- I think it's maybe confirmation bias. It's, you know, there's a bunch of different biases that go into it for the preparedness community. But so many of us are, believe that this thing, this, you know, this, this bugaboo, this, you know, th- their minotaur or whatever it is, is going to happen. Like, oh, the, the country's going to melt down or we're going to be in a civil war this year and this and that. I mean, do I think we we maybe we're heading that way? Yeah, maybe. But it doesn't mean it's going to happen. You know, I interviewed, do you know who Arthur Bradley is? The he's the um kind of like the Dr. Arthur name. Bradley. He's he's big into the EMPs. He's published a bunch okay. of books. Okay, that's why I know that name. Yeah, and so, you know, he he had talked about that, you know, like it may happen. It may not happen, right? Like we can't be we can't ride our whole train ruining your today, you know, like going into debt to get all prepared so that way you're struggling and then this thing never happens. So I, I started in the preparedness world back in when it was a survivalist era back in the late 80s and I my my buddy's dad got me into it. And I remember mm-hmm. it was like like every six months it's like this is it. The balloon's going up. Society's done, man. Head for the hills. Get your MREs. Get your guns and, you know, Wolverines, you know, doing – get out there and do your thing. And I'm like, Oh crap, this is happening. Yeah. Then it would, it was like Y2K. Oh, that's it. Tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it's December 31st. And you know, in about 12 hours, it's Mad Maxville. Yeah. And then December, you know, January 1st rolls around the new century comes around and everybody's like, Hey, what's up? Nothing happened. We, we, as whether you want to think it as, as a species or as a society, yeah have a a terrible track record for predicting disaster. We're really bad at it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I tell people that at some point, sure, something's going to happen, but like, you know, a lot of people, um, some, a fair number of the guests I've had on the show got into preparedness after hurricane Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. They saw this thing hit. They saw like people were on their own. They showed bodies in the streets and the whole nine years. Yeah. I'm like, I go, but you look at it as devastating as Hurricane Katrina was. Like, it affected a large region, but the odds of you getting hit by that are pretty slim because you had to be right there, right? Like, now, if you are there, obviously prepare. Um, But yeah, I think it really comes back to people 
you you were talking earlier um, about how you pre, you know when you prepare things you're looking at what's most likely to happen. You were talking about the EMP and all that. That's that's a whole you know that's a whole line of business. That's a that's a profession. Professional risk managers, and and they put they they put numbers to what's your threat. You know, what's the consequence if that, if some, if that threat Mm -hmm. impacts you and then what are your vulnerabilities? Like, what do you, what do you, what ability do you have to stop that threat or minimize that threat? So you're not impacted. And those are literally, you put numbers to that so you can come out and you can look that, oh, this thing that I'm really worried about, let's say the EMP or whatever that is. Yeah, that's not a big risk, right? I think you said Spearco had some sort of way he looked at it with, yeah, you know, so I think that's huge because it takes, we've been talking about the emotional mindset. When you put metrics to it, metrics are rational, mm-hmm. right? Here's the numbers. And then if you want to see, if you, a person sees the numbers, but then say, and it numbers say, Hey, your biggest threat is someone stealing your car in your driveway. That's your biggest risk but you're still going, Oh, I got to prep for the CMP. That's my, you know, and not do anything to secure the car. Well, now you're making an emotional decision, which is a sympathetic nervous system response. Right. And I think for a lot of us, and I think this happens, I think this is what pushes a lot of people into the prepper space is they have a really strong emotional reaction to what is going on. You know, they, 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 they're still watching the news. They're still reading the news (laughs) And they're overwhelmed and somehow they they stumble on this notion, I can prepare for these horrible things. And they react out of that emotion because it makes them feel like they have some semblance of control over things. And, and I'll admit, I go there sometimes. There are days sure. when, you know, I'm feeling vulnerable and I catch the wrong news story or somebody gives me some, some bad information and a lot of what okay all right let's uh let's see what grocery store has beans on sale right like i try to channel it in that way because maybe it's not the healthiest but it's healthier right it's it's that it's that balance again it makes me feel good okay i've done something i'll go to the range you know i'll, I'll put some rounds through some paper that makes me feel better i'm i'm propping up my skills Maybe I'll I'll go in the living room and I'll push the furniture back and I'll I'll throw some kicks until I'm tired. It's really hard to be scared or angry when you're sweating and you can't breathe. Yeah. Well, that's you know doing that, putting rounds down range, going you know like you said, punching holes in papers and throwing kicks. Um, it's a it's a form of meditation, right? Like when people think about meditation and people are like, oh, that's you know foo foo and all that. It's woo. Um. But I, uh, it, it, you don't have to sit there with your legs crossed, doing the alms and having your incense burning to meditate. It's something that keeps you in the present, keeps you in the here and now. So you're not thinking about, oh, what's this future problem? What's this past problem? Or worrying about all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a good way to help shut down that sympathetic nervous system response. A- anything can be meditative. Yeah. When you cook dinner, turn off the music, turn off the TV, focus on your cooking. Next time you drive, turn off the radio, try to quiet the thoughts, focus on your driving. Those are great kind of intros to being meditative. And, you know, if we think about it, how often do we get quiet space? I know the value of it. I advocate for it. And I don't even do it that much. Yeah. But I had some time earlier today after lunch. I was just sitting in a, in a chair by the fire going... I put my phone over there and just kind of sat for it's just five minutes, but it feels good. Mm -hmm. It feels really good. And it's also very strange if people aren't used to it. It can be uh, the silence can be loud. (laughs) It's true. It's good to get comfortable with it. Well, I think especially in today's world, man, that um, we're bombarded so much with noise, right? Not even information is a version, you know, it's, if you're getting it off the screen, that's light noise. I mean, it's, we're just bombarded with noise. So unplugging and sitting down, it's. I think it gives our brain a rest for a little bit. Um, some of what I do is is in the, the business and the marketing world. And so I've got some data in the back of my head. The average person receives, and, and there's disagreement on it, but the consensus is tens of thousands of messages per day. 
advertising and such, right? It's a lot. We were not designed to receive all this information. It's overwhelming. We are not built for it. So if you feel like you're you're overwhelmed, that's why. Speaking of that, so, you know, it takes, especially that people are so plugged into this stuff. And, you know, I, I want to say the average person checks their phone for messages and emails and whatever, 300 and something times a day. Wouldn't surprise me. So it takes discipline to do that. And, you know, mm -hmm. and since you, you've you been doing martial arts for so long and, and being an instructor and everything, how do you instill that kind of mental discipline in people? What do you tell them? Yeah. Um, you know, discipline in its simplest form is, is convincing yourself to do something that you know is good for you that maybe you're feeling some resistance to. So if we take that example of checking your phone, I turned off the notifications for my email on my phone. Mm -hmm. So every time it beeps or buzzes, I don't have to look at it. Yeah. Because the project that I'm working on is probably more important. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a paramedic. Nobody's dying if I don't respond to that email in 10 minutes, right? One of the things that happens in martial arts, and this does not happen in very many other places, I'll have my students do things. They don't know how long they're going to do it. I'll have them get into a deep stance. Oh, that kills and, and, you know, they're, they're sitting in, for those of you out there who have trained, maybe they're in horse stance and they're doing punches. How long are they going to be in a horse stance? Well, not all class. But is it a minute or is it two minutes? And very, very other place, few, very few other places in our lives are we expected to do a thing, but we don't know for how long. And that builds discipline quickly. I like that, man. Because as soon as you said that, not knowing how long you're going to be doing it, oh, my 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 stuff went crazy, man. I just got a mm -hmm. surge of electricity through me like, oh, no, that's the most horrible thing in the world. I used yeah. to do that um, in the army. We'd go for these five-mile runs, that five-mile run. And then because if the, the battalion commander was leading it, he always wanted to do a gut check. So you you knew where you were going to stop, and then he would head down that road and then run right by the stopping point, and you'd end up doing mm -hmm. like an extra two or three miles. And it was just this... Dude, that those were the hardest. I mean, we would run a lot of times, 10, you know, we ran a lot. So it wasn't yeah. like we couldn't run it. But just the fact of of that mental side of it, like, oh, we're you you think you're done and then they keep going. And it's just like, mm -hmm. dude, it was it like that that was a that made it ah. a, like a mental gut check every time. And and here's kind of the proof coming from the other side of that, you know, everybody's capable of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I've done it myself. I've I've coached other people through it at the gym. They're lifting weights. You know, they're expecting that, the, you know, that they can do eight. You're going to do 12. And I convinced them they're going to do 12. That 12th rep is just as hard as the eighth rep would have been if they had set out to do eight. If I told you I'm going to give you a million dollars to do a 13th rep, they'd find the ability. Yeah. Or that 14th rep, right? We can all, there's always more. We can always dig a little bit deeper. And discipline is recognizing that you have that. I, I don't, I don't want to go metaphysical and say unlimited potential, but you oh, do yeah, have go for more. it, man. <laughs> there's always a little more, yeah. right? And, you know, different martial arts schools lean into this more than others, but I've been through some some training where I I knew what time we started. I didn't know what we were going to do, and I didn't know when it was going to end. Yeah. And I didn't know how to prepare because it wasn't about preparation. It was about that experience in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I look back, you know, my the first my first black belt test. If I can make it through that, I can make it through anything. I know that nothing I have ever done in my life has been more difficult than that period of time. It was brutal. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's, you know, it's it's kind of what my sort of jam is. It's a lot of mindset. I say capability. I in the book, it's it's I have I put up a capability formula. And it's mm -hmm. really it's your your mindset plus your knowledge, your skills, and your resources, right? Like if you don't have a good mindset, eh, everything that comes after it's not you you can have the best of everything. It may not work well, right? It, if you don't have the knowledge, then again, if you don't have the resources. So I think that 
I, but I think the mindset comes on the front side of everything. It's so important for people. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you probably at least saw in passing the show MacGyver, right? I mean, what was the <laughs> beauty of MacGyver? What, what did everybody know going in every single week with MacGyver? He's going to find a way. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's available. He could be working with a paperclip and a shoelace. He'd find a way to do whatever had to be done because that was his job and that was his approach. He didn't think, oh, well, I can't do this because I don't have this or I didn't bring that or I don't know this. He just would keep going until he found a way. And that that approach shows up, yeah, in martial arts, but it shows up in entrepreneurship. It shows up in the best professional athletes. It shows up in the best leaders. Maybe you don't know what needs to be done, but you know you're not going to stop until you've found a path. How do you get someone who's, you know, and and this isn't to to crap on people at all, but you have, <laughs> but people, and I mean, I'm just, I'm guilty of it. Like at times it's where we've gotten out of that mindset or maybe we've never really gotten there um, to get that resilient mindset where they go, okay, I'm going to go out and struggle. Like, you know, to, I'm going to improve. And like we talked earlier, improving requires some sort of resistance. You got to read a book, you got to spend time, you know, burn up your resource. How do you get, how can an individual tap into that on their own? How can they, what can they do to, you know, they to have to see the value first off. Yeah. They have to recognize that learning how to struggle is a skill set. And if it is not a skill set you have, you have to recognize the value that is contained therein. Right? This is why, you know, if, if you look at, um, I spent a lot of time in the CrossFit space. And there was a period of time where the folks dominating competitive CrossFit were farmers. Oh, I guess that kind of makes sense. Because Go you got to get the work done, right? You just yeah. kind of grit it out. I've got X amount of work to do. I can either take all day to do it or I can get it done a little bit faster. And now I've got time to go fishing or whatever. Right. And there's some, there's some of that in there. It's no secret that we live in a much softer time sure. than any other time. That's not to say that there aren't exceptions, that some people have difficult things going on, and there certainly are places in the world that are in, a, in worse shape now than they were, say, a short time ago. Not, not pretending that those things aren't true. But if we want to be able to tap into that, we have to identify something that might help us get there and make a commitment to it. You know, a lot of times, and, 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 you know, we talk about this in martial arts circles that, you know, there's a certain quality of person that will start, they'll come to a class or two classes and it's difficult or they have a, a difficult experience and they never show up again. They're exactly the person that needs to be there. Mm. I had somebody that showed up to a class, they were referred in by, by an existing student and I found out later that, yeah, they came and they did okay, but they'd rather just sit on the couch and get drunk that, at that time. And my response was, they can get drunk after, but that's the easy way, right? Right. Everything that we do, we're either getting better at or worse at. doesn't matter what it is, right? You can score anything, come up with a way to score it. You're getting better at it or worse at it. And if you don't feel that you are a disciplined human being and you're not doing anything to become a more disciplined human being, you are becoming a less disciplined human being. Yeah. And that's choice. It is a choice. It's all choice. We all have the same 24. We all prioritize the things that are most important to us. And I get a lot of pushback when I say that to some people. They don't like it. They don't. Well, you know, I, I've got to do... Yeah, because your job is important to you. Your family is important to you. These other things are important to you. I'm not taking that away. I'm also not telling anybody what should be important to them. But if you consistently put something on the bottom of your list, it's always going to be at the bottom of your list. It's never going to improve. 
Yeah. You've got to find some way. And this is where, I don't know if you get into any of Tony Robbins stuff, but the most important thing that Tony talks about is finding your why. You've mm -hmm. got to have a compelling reason. We don't make changes unless we have a powerful reason. And yeah. this is where in a lot of martial arts circles, you know, somebody will start training because they or somebody they knew were in a situation or almost in a situation. Or they see that their child is becoming maybe a little bit of a dick. Mm -hmm. And they want to give them, you know, some of the things that are not instilled in public schools anymore, generally. Right. Well, I think so that's, you know, that's the case in the preparedness world, right? People prepare because they found their why. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it could be, like I said, it could be not something that's not metrically, you know, through the metrics of risk management, a, uh, the reality of their risk, but it it's what drives them to say, Hey, I got to have this stuff. You know, I, I have to spend all this time, this money, these resources to do that. And they get their why. I guess they need to figure out on other ways, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe it hits other people. I'm not sure. But I know as the older I get, the more I'm I'm getting, I'm really diving more and more into health. It's like, you know, I mean, when you're young, you can, you know, I abused the heck out of my body, right? And, you know, I, I, I loved going out and having fun going out partying and then you know and eat a bunch of crappy food but and then you get up next morning it was great i could go for a go for a hike go for a workout do whatever but now like it doesn't happen and it's it's more in tune on the why of oh because you don't have a lot of years left on this plan we don't have a lot of years left you know when we start right like and so it's like, hey, I want to extend them and enjoy them and be as healthy as possible. Sure. So I've been watching The Sopranos, and they um, uh, and they show when I don't know if you if you watch The Sopranos at all. I, but, I've I've watched a bit of the beginning. I got derailed into another show. Oh I'll, I'll yeah, back, I just but please continue. I binged watched like the la the the all six seasons. I got the last episode. Oh, nice. I'm watching tonight. But the um, Tony Soprano's uncle Junior. And towards the end of the series, he ends up in an uh, old folks home with Alzheimer's. And I look at that and I'm like, I don't mean, you know, you can only control so much with your brain, but I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want to ever become so debilitated as an old person that I have a tough time moving around. So, you know, and especially the older you get, right, you, you start losing muscle mass because you stop doing resistance stuff. You're not working, you're not doing whatever. So it's like, that's my why when I sit in, and we, we talked earlier about podcasts, you know, you can sit in front of a screen doing editing and I, I can burn up eight hours sitting here doing this. But in sure. the middle of the day, it's like, hey, I got to I don't want to go to the gym. I hate going to the gym just because it, it it's I, I actually enjoy it when I get there and do it. But the thought of going there drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's but other it, stuff to do. I, but I, it's like I, I have. Well, it's I, I, I think. Part of mine is my post-traumatic stress issues. It's just, mm. it doesn't want me to feel good about doing some stuff, but I'm like, I have to do it. I like force myself out. I remember listening to David Goggins and he was talking about at times where he just stares at his running shoes. I mean, this is a guy that will get up and go running at three o'clock in the morning because he, he wakes up and he thinks he's a slacker for sleeping, but he'll stare at his running shoes and like have these battles, like to get his shoes on his feet because, and that's, the task that that he has to overcome to be able to get out the door. Yeah, we all deal with those battles, right? They yeah. might come from different reasons. You know, it might be post traumatic stress for one person. It might be feeling like I didn't accomplish enough at at you know my day job, or it could be you know somebody else in your ear. There's so many reasons. There are an infinite number of reasons to say no. But you said something that I, I want to touch on. You know, in in the prep space, uh, people often try to outsource prepping from the time to just the money. They just buy the things. They never learn how to use the things. They just, they stockpile stuff. And then they, you know, they're, they're morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. Maybe they smoke. They drink a lot. They do nothing for exercise. And I think that that raises two points that I think are really important. And the first one is, your stuff can be separated from you. Your skills, your knowledge cannot be. Two, do you really want to go through whatever situations you're preparing for with cancer? Yeah. With diabetes, mm -hmm. right? No matter what it is, it's going to be easier 
if you're in a good state of mind and body. Yeah. It's worth it. it, it yeah. To say it bluntly, being in shape is preparing. It is. And it, it, you're, you're right on that. It's one of the things I'm trying to um, figure out. Have you heard of the rule of threes, survival rule of threes? It's the the adage. It's um, three minutes. You can go three oh. minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food, right? So I put on there, I, I've created a survival pyramid that kind of flows off of that where it's a third of a second without situational awareness. Mm. Uh, and then you run into um, – three minutes without oxygen, right? So being able to do CPR or stop major bleeding and stuff. And so I've been trying to, I'm, I'm working on where I'm putting health and fitness into this whole pyramid because it is so important. You know, you mentioned the diabetes. Well, uh, thanks to mom, I have type two diabetes, right? And so I, if, if I want, I can sit down and eat a bunch. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm a stress eater. I love to eat. Like eating is one of my the things that makes me the happiest on the face of the planet. But then I watch my blood sugar, and like you know, and I have a I, I keep a blood sugar tester out in my living room, and like I oh look what I ate, and here's my blood sugar is going crazy. Whereas if I eat the 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 cauliflower rice, I can go back and, and I can diet control my stuff so my blood sugar stays down like it you know in the low in the low hundreds where it's supposed to be. When I look at that, and there's so many people out there that are because we, you know, people are heavy and they're doing everything these days. They're eating a bunch of garbage. Um, it was something that really hit me the other day. I was watching diabetes takes every ten years that you have in diabetes where you're not really watching your blood sugar takes three years off your life. I believe it. Three years, right? So if you're diabetic for thirty years. And you didn't control it. You just, you know, went and ate pizzas and stuffed a bunch of sugar down your throat and just went for it. Nine years yeah. on average that you're cutting off your life. And that's just mind blowing when you think about years. Like, it's like you talk about that. Why there is a why right there. And those years up to that nine, how many of those mm -hmm. last few years are on dialysis? Yeah. How many of those last or... few years are not going to be there? post whatever thing people are preparing for not being their quality right like again that's you know having the best quality so hey let's kick it back over to martial arts a little bit sure. so martial arts is great it gets you mental discipline it gets you used to interacting really close with other people there's a, mm -hmm. it gets you flexible it helps strength it gets your ass off the couch like there's so much about it that's good especially in today's society what advice do you have for someone who wants to start out? And then also, especially for like older people getting it. Like I didn't start jujitsu until I was in my, my mid I'm, I'm 56, but until my mid fifties. Right. And, you know, I started getting into it and it's, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> like there's no, no doubt about it. Cause I, it's just, I'm not as flexible. I come, you know, I end up coming home in more pain what, sure. what advice would you get to someone wanting to get into it and, and then for what older people? So first, um, kind of the, the generic advice. Mm -hmm. If you ask the people around you where you should go train, most of them are going to tell you where they train. And that's not nice. necessarily helpful. What are your goals? What time are you willing to commit to this? How far are you willing to drive? Is budget a concern, right? Those are all incredibly relevant. And the way I recommend people start is, okay, I'm here. What are all the schools within the driving distance I'm willing to look at, okay? Yeah. Cross out the ones that offer classes when you can't go. What's left? Are there budgetary concerns? Cross out the ones that are more expensive than you can handle. And then from there, you're doing some research. You're looking at some reviews. Always visit a class before you step on the floor. Uh, I discourage people from signing long-term contracts before they have spent some time training. And give it a shot. And recognize that one school might be completely different from another school. Mm -hmm. the, vari the, the variance in martial arts schools is... I don't know if there's anything else that can be more varied. Maybe yoga can be as varied. But you go to a, 
a typical gym, you've got a pretty good idea what's going to be there. You go to a grocery store, you've got a pretty good idea what's going to be there. But the same style of martial arts can be trained dramatically differently and taught dramatically differently. And, and this is where I think a lot of people go wrong because they'll give it a shot. And it doesn't click for them. Yeah. And they never go back. And they never try another school. To me, the question should not be if you should do martial arts. It's where you should do martial arts. For all of the reasons that we've talked about in our, you know, over the last hour and a half that we've yeah. been talking, right? Like right. We, we've talked about a lot of reasons and there is nothing else that checks more boxes. I believe traditional martial arts training is the puzzle piece to plug in to the gaps for most modern lives, whether you're an adult or a child, flexibility, strength, community, discipline, self-esteem, um, cognitive improvements as you're learning new skills. We could keep going. I, I don't want to bore people. It's a long list. There is nothing else that I'm aware of that has that long of a list. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was part one. Part two, older folks. As long as you're willing to give it a shot, damn near every martial arts school would love to have you regardless of your age. I have a gentleman who started in my school who is 75. He'd never done martial arts before. And he wrote me and he oh, said, that's awesome, I've, man. I've that's never awesome. done this before. Can I try? Yeah. And you know, that's what's great. great about it. I that's mean, he, awesome. he, he is an active man, but he sees the challenges that show up for him because he's not as flexible because he's not done this. Mm -hmm. But I, I've watched him kind of, um, work through some of the frustrations. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the more disciplined people. Just as a great example, last night we were doing some, some flexibility stuff and I had encouraged people. I said, if you want to use the wall as a balance point so you can focus on the flexibility piece, go for it. I didn't. He did a few with his hand on the wall and then he stepped away from the wall and he was doing it freestanding while all but one other person was using the wall for balance. Now that's not a judgment of them. That's that's how hard he's working on this and he's seeing the results. He is killing it. Um, there's there's a gentleman now, granted, he's a um he was in UFC three, started BJJ at 80. Hmm. Right? You're never too late to move. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're past the point where you want to get punched in the face really hard. Well, some schools don't make as big of a deal of that as others. In fact, I would say few schools punch people in the face really hard. And that's where doing your research. So I don't care how old you are, what physical shape you are in, how much time you have, et cetera. There's a way to train. And I would encourage everyone out there to make that a goal. The, the, I think I said at the beginning, the stated goal of, of, of our company, Whistlekick, is to get everyone in the world to train for six months because I'm not aware of anything else that so universally helps people become better versions of themselves. Yeah, and I think if you make it the six months, that that's what you kind of went down a little bit of, you know, that bullet point list at the beginning of flexibility, mental discipline and all that. The other side of that is humility. You know, especially, and I'm sure it's the same with all the martial arts, you know, and like, I know going into jujitsu later, it's like, you just try to do some of the drills to get down the mat at the beginning of the warm up. you know, you're, 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 you feel like a monkey. You're looking at everybody Anybody else. Anybody the know? first day when they learn shrimping. Yeah. Right? You're shrimping. Like, yeah. How, how does my body work? How? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it it's terrible. And then yeah. you actually try to start, you know, Hey, let me get together and roll with somebody. And you're like, Oh, what the, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of humility. I think it, it, it's a very humbling thing, but I think that's a good sign. You know, it's it absolutely, it, it was going back to the, um, the tie boxing, getting, going in the ring and then having, you know, when I was young and having my instructor get in there and just like you realize real quick, it's like going in with, you know, a white belt probably goes in with you. Like all of a sudden you realize like, oh, I like, I don't know zero. Like, like 
I started jujitsu in Vegas and I remember going in and I was, I was training with the, um, the guy who ran the school, the professor there. And I remember the first time we, we were doing anything and I was just like, Oh, this, like, if this guy ever got his hands on me out in public, there isn't, there is nothing I could do about this. And then realizing that you're starting at that point of zero, you know, have you ever heard of the Dunning Kruger effect? It remind I, I have, I, I wouldn't be it, able to. So it. it's, it's a, it's a cognitive bias kind of thing. And what it states okay. is when someone knows very little, they think they know like a ton and they more have a ton of confidence. Yeah. And then as they learn more, their confidence level drops and drops and drops and drops. And eventually they start learning em- enough to where they start gaining confidence. But at no point in their knowledge after that, will they ever have the confidence they did when they knew, yeah. when they knew hardly anything. And from my understanding, there is nothing that is, that exemplifies that better than the typical, admittedly, male perspective on their own fighting abilities. <laughs> All right. There, there's most men. I, I, it's it's some stupid number uh, of men think that they could win a, a a professional MMA fight against professional MMA fighters, right? Even untrained people. It's just it's fascinating. But you're right. You know, it, it there there's a humility that comes through because there's always somebody better than you, and that person might not be better in their school. I'm the best person in my school. Shock, right? I I'm the instructor, not a not a, right. a a bad guess, but I know plenty of people way better than me, and I love working with them because that's how I get better. Because I I don't care about being the best; I care about my skills developing. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's that's key. And um, last last question: What about sure. people who feel they may not have? You know, I guess you kind of talked about already with the guy that's seventy five years old that's just starting out. That may that feel they may not be you know have the physical capability you know, and they kind of yeah they they let that pigeonhole themselves into not getting out there. There, is, I am not aware of a. Let's call it an industry. I don't. I don't love that term, but we don't have a, necessarily a better term for collectively referring to martial arts schools. I'm not aware of an industry that is more open and welcoming to all sorts of people. When when you're on the floor, mats, whatever it is, whatever you're training, politics doesn't matter. Your height, your weight don't really matter. Your experience doesn't really matter what you went through that day doesn't matter your flexibility doesn't matter because generally speaking we are training by ourselves for ourselves with other people Mm -hmm. you might work with other people they might help you get better as you help them get better but it's still individual training done in a group setting so if you show up I'm, i'm thinking of someone that you know, we've had a lot of conversations about how to to bring her in because she has some physical challenges. You know, not you know, we're not talking about something easy to 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 explain like a wheelchair, yeah. but just she's she's got some stuff and she's older and she's really interested. And so we're we're working this out. How do we do this in a way that she has a positive experience and everyone else also has a positive experience? And that sort of approach is not atypical. This is what most martial arts schools do. Most martial arts schools, if you are willing to put in the effort to show up, they will fight tooth and nail to help you progress. Yeah, that was my experience. You know, when I when I started jujitsu, a lot was the senior belts were very like, hey, let me show you this. Yeah. And you'd get down and, and you would roll and, and, you know, obviously they're not trying to kill you, not trying to strangle you, but it's, it's just, it's show you and explain it to you. This is, this hand goes here, then this is what you do. And they're really patient, but they make you work at it also, right? Like you're still getting tired and you're still working yeah. it out. That's great. 
You've like got to you've got to figure this stuff out for yourself on some level, right? You're being guided, you're being taught, but you know, anybody who's ever worked with kids, you can't teach someone something that doesn't want to know it, right? You can't right. make someone learn. So that that's that's the encouragement. If if what I'm talking about today makes you think this could be for me, try it. And if the school you try doesn't work out for you, try another school and try another school. And if you have a hard time finding a school, I will help you. Awesome, man. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's a good place to sort of uh, wrap it up. If you would um, let people know, give them if there's any final thoughts or sure. anything where they can find you, um, everything about it. Because, man, it's been a good show. I enjoy these. Uh, I like people who I can go down some of the deeper rabbit holes and have these, yeah. these nice conversations with. Yeah, so I, I've had that. a blast, Brian. This has been a lot of fun. Tangents yeah. and, and and always coming back and just absolutely really appreciate your time. Uh, if people want to reach me, my email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. The website is whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And, and I've got this saying, martial arts gives back exactly and only what you put into it. And there are very few things in life that you can say that about. Because even if you come in with some natural talent, unless you're going to be a professional fighter, that natural talent really doesn't mean anything. It's about how far you've progressed. It's about the time and effort you've put in and what you have to show for it. Because it tempers you. You know, Every time you go to class, it's, it's like a blacksmith putting another hammer stroke down on a blade, that blade gets stronger, it's more resilient, it's able to take a sharper edge. And that's what we have the ability to do for ourselves. And as you do it more and more, you're also helping the other people around, not just the people that you're training with, but the people at home. If you're more focused, if you're more disciplined, if you're more patient, how's that gonna impact your family and your coworkers? How that's, how's that gonna affect your job? How's this going to affect your health? And you give other people permission to also grow and become better versions of themselves. So please don't, don't avoid it. That's awesome, man. I appreciate that. So um, yeah, whistlekick.com, everybody. It's a, you won't be sorry. It's been, been a good, good conversation, man. I really, I really appreciate it. So.